Greetings Legacy Ministry College. I'm honored to be with you today. My name is Keith Collins, and some of you might know me. I know there's a few students that um, that I know personally, so I'm honored to be with you today at your chapel service, and I pray that what I'm going to share will be an encouragement, a blessing, as well as a challenge to you. And for those that don't know me, just a real quick introduction. I do have the honor of sitting on the board of this college, and praise God for Pastor Joe and all the others that are heading this up. And just really excited to see what God's doing. I know there's some quality students that are plugging into Legacy. And I also know that God's going to use you mightily in the days ahead. For the last 20 plus years, 22, 23 years, I've been blessed to, to train leaders through the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry and then through Fire School of Ministry. Um, Brownsville, of course, was located in Pensacola, Florida. And then fire originated in Pensacola. Then the school moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and um, still do some online stuff with them. But really excited about this new college and the entire format of it, the the DNA of this of this this university. And I, like I said, I know that God's going to raise up amazing leaders over the coming days, over the coming years, should the Lord Terry, um, that are going to be launched out, sent forth. Um, in power and in might and in demonstration. And I believe we'll see the world change because of Legacy Ministry College. So congratulations for being a part of this. Let me encourage you to, to be faithful to your studies, to be faithful to prayer, to be faithful, again, to the assignments that you're giving. I believe that our faithfulness in these areas are the things that the Lord looks at that even help to assist in doors that open for our ministries and our callings in the days ahead. So the Bible is clear that if we're faithful over small things, that he will make us ruler over larger things or many things. So again, congratulations for being a part of this school. I want to just open up in prayer and then some things upon, there's some things upon my heart that I want to impart into you today. And I pray that again, you'll be encouraged and challenged as you listen today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you've allowed us to be together. I thank you for every individual that's listening to this today. Every one of these students that you have assembled to legacy for this season. Lord, I just ask that you would take them deeper in your purposes. Lord, awaken your kingdom to them. May we have your heart. May we have your burden. May we know you in power and in demonstration. Lord, if there's anything in our lives that are hindering us from fully committing even to this season this tenure at Legacy, we just pray today, God, that those things would fall away, and Lord, that we would be focused on the purpose for why we're here. Take this message now and stir our hearts. Lord, may none of us be the same after this chapel service because we've met with you and we've heard your word. We pray these things now in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, there's so many things on my heart that I could share and that that I would like to share. But as I, I prayed about this opportunity, and again, thank you, Pastor Joe, for making this available to me. As I prayed about this, I simply asked the question, you know, in this semester, what is it that you would have me to pour into this student body? And I believe the Lord really brought me back to such a foundational theme and experience that that I live throughout my life. I, I'm currently writing a new book that'll be out November the 1st um, entitled First Love Fire. And the subtitle is Living a Life of Sustained Surrender. The purpose for the book is really to, number one, awaken a fresh hunger for the glory of God in our lives. But number two, to really help us to become stewards of the call of God upon each and every one of this or us. And I, I believe oftentimes that we get kind of caught up in the the power and the demonstration of the ministry, and, and thank God for that. I, I believe the Word of God's clear that signs and wonders should even follow the preaching of the gospel, and by the grace of God, I've seen signs and wonders now for over 37 years of ministry, but oftentimes I think we get enamored with the signs and the wonders, however, we neglect the place of really walking with the Lord. Now, this is not a new message, and I'm sure even through your time at Legacy thus far, you, you've you heard some of these things that I'll share today. But again, as I asked the Lord, you know, what is it that I could impart into you 
um, that I believe would be something that would not just be beneficial to you during your tenure as a student, but beyond that, as you go forth from this place and this season into the next season, um, I believe this is so important, so foundational and so life changing. And I know that without it, there is no way that I could do or even be what God has called me to do and what God has called me to be. So if I had to give this a title for those that are taking notes today, I would simply call this disturbing prayer, disturbing prayer. And that might sound like an interesting title to you, and it's supposed to. Um I believe that that prayer is so life changing that it should bring about a divine disturbance that that it is so transformational. It is so powerful. It is such a glorious realm of understanding and walking with God that really it's the foundation of who we are as his people. And without it, then we just simply become a caricature of what he's called us to be. And and let me say from the outset here that. Thank God for gifting. Thank God for talent. Thank God for the ability to preach, the ability to to, to play instruments and maybe lead worship or teach a class, um, whatever. I mean, all those things are valuable. They're all important and God uses them all. But can I tell you that you can do all those things without prayer? And with that being said, you can learn to do all those things even through your own human ability and your own natural giftings. But there is something disturbing about prayer. Prayer impacts and affects the atmosphere, the atmosphere of heaven, the atmosphere of earth, and even the atmosphere of darkness, the atmosphere of hell. It it changes everything because it is such a powerful weapon. The Bible is clear when it says the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the tearing down or the pulling down of stronghold. And I believe the greatest weapon that we have in our spiritual arsenal is the weapon of prayer. So I, I want to look at some, some things today that I believe are so important when it comes to this theme. Um, and let me just say that the church has to embrace her role in prayer and intercession if we are going to effectively accomplish on the earth what God has called us to accomplish. I I believe that there is a a plague of busyness in a lot of the church today. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, we have learned in modern Christendom or modern Christianity to, to do church. We've, we've learned to build mega churches and we've learned to have the right programs and how to attract young people and, and how to attract families with young children. And some of that's fine and God can use some of that. But again, the danger of learning to do good church and learning to administrate effectively is that we can do all that without prayer. We can have a creative person that can come up with ideas and those ideas could could be of God, but without prayer, the only thing that we have is human ability and, and human knowledge and human strength. But, but prayer brings about a disturbance in everything that we do. Let me give you an example here. I was in the nation of India on a mission trip, um, missions trip several years ago, probably 12, 15 years ago now, maybe 15, 16 years ago, actually. It was a long time ago. We were there and we were scheduled to do ministry. We were doing large outdoor meetings with, with thousands of people, primarily Hindus that were coming to the meetings. During the day, we were doing um, teachings and conference type things with with leaders and pastors, village pastors primarily that were coming in from around Southern India. and about two days into the ministry, there was just such a spirit of darkness that we felt hovering over the area. And we were not intimidated by this, but the leader there, the apostolic leader there felt that we needed to stop all the activity and to engage God in prayer until we had a breakthrough. So literally, the decision was made by that leader to shut down all the busyness, all the activity, all the meetings. The people that had come in were told, we're going to take three days. We're going to fast and we're going to pray and we're going to believe God for breakthrough. Now, about the third day, one afternoon, we were in prayer with several people. I remember, there was folks there from South Korea and different parts of the world. And, and we were praying and you can literally feel like a supernatural disturbance take place. We We prayed into victory. The old people, when I first got saved back in 1985, they would call it, they were praying through, or they prayed through 
and to the victory. And they knew that God had moved. So we felt release from that fasting and prayer burden for the specific um, mandate upon us to have breakthrough for those ministry outlets that we were engaged in while they're in India. So we literally resumed ministry the next day. And I can tell you there was a supernatural grace upon the ministry there. Like I've only seen a few times in my life. Now, my, my point is this, um, there are things that do not happen except we pray. John Wesley said, we can do no more than pray until we have prayed. And he said, or I'm sorry, I think John Bunyan said that John, John Wesley said that, um, that, um, we can, uh, there are some things that God will not do. There it is, except the people of God pray. And I'm paraphrasing, but in other words, some of these early church leaders understood that it took disturbing prayer to churn up the atmosphere that the, so that the purposes of God could come forth. Now, I want to, I want to read something from the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the church there in Rome, the book of Romans, and listen to the way that Paul describes prayer here in Romans 8. This is such a powerful um, narrative here. It said, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And I think the old King James says, through groanings, which cannot be uttered. And he searches our hearts and knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now, this is a this is a really powerful picture that Paul gives us here. Paul is literally describing a place of prayer where the Holy Spirit comes upon us in such power that literally our 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 vocal cords begin to groan and utter because we don't even know what we ought to pray. We we know that we feel the heart of God in what we're praying for, but the Holy Spirit literally takes over our being. Why? Because he knows the mind and the heart of the Father, and the Holy Spirit begins to pray through us. Now, this is truly a place of divine disturbance, and I would say this. I believe there are not many people in the church today, whether it be in America or even around the world. Now, I know there's some, but I preached in 37 nations, and I think in almost every state in America, maybe there's three or four that I haven't been in, and I have rarely found this type of prayer to where there is such an engagement with the heart of God and the burden of God that the Lord literally takes over an individual's being their heart, their spirit, their, their vocal cords, and they, they, they groan with words that can't be uttered. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is on them in such a, a season of intensity to where they literally, I believe, begin to feel exactly what God feels. Now, I, I can say that in my own life, um, my prayer time is not always like that. And, and again, there are different types of prayer. I, I teach on prayer. And, um, you know, there's prayers of uh, there's penitential or repentance prayers. There's there's prayer, prayers of supplication. There's play, prayers of contrition. There's like that that soaking type of just experience in the glory of God. But this type of prayer where we literally align our hearts with the heart of God and we become one with his heartbeat and with his burden and the very breath of eternity begins to operate within our beings is, I believe, what is needed in this generation, friend. Um, David Wilkerson preached a message years ago, and I think the title was something like, Whatever Happened to Groaning or, or, or Urgency or Urgent Prayer, pretty much is what he was talking about. In other words, what happened, I think maybe agony, whatever happened to agony, where, where are those that, that are willing to, to step into the place where the Lord is at? and experience his heart for a dying generation, for a dying city, for a dying nation? Where are those people that are willing to become agitators in the Holy Spirit, people that are bold enough to, to ask the Lord, give me your heart for this hour, God. Use my life as a firebrand in the prayer closet and let me come forth from the prayer closet full of the fire of God with the word of God in my lips. And may I stand before a, a dark degenerate generation and thunder the truth of the word of God. Why? Because I've known him in the place of prayer and I have 
seen how the Lord can change hearts, can change a community, can change a city. Why? Because, friend, we align our lives with him and we align our hearts with him and he consumes our being. He literally possesses our being and the Holy Spirit begins to pray through us. Now, now there are many examples throughout history that we can look to, to where we can see how the Lord moved because individuals were willing to embrace his heart in prayer and intercession. There was a great revivalist in the second great awakening in America in the 1800s by the name of Charles Finney. Maybe some of you have heard of Charles Finney, but but Finney had a very powerful evangelistic ministry, and he would go into cities like um, Yonkers, New York, and different places. And oftentimes, most of the city would be radically converted. The bars would shut down because there was such a move of God that took place. But some people don't realize, matter of fact, many people don't realize that there were two men connected to his ministry, one by the name of Abel Clary and the other one named um, Daniel Nash. They called him Father Nash. And these men were, were men that would oftentimes go before Finney to these cities, and they would pray. They would churn up the atmosphere. They would bring disturbing prayer. And then Finney would come in after their prayer times, and they would see great harvest. And the his, history even says that there were times when Finney would be preaching on the wooden platform, and underneath the platform, Daniel Nash would literally be interceding for the people that he was preaching to. I I knew a lady personally. She went to be with the Lord um, December, I think the 29th of this past year, very close to her. She was up in her 80s. Her name was Margaret Viss. And um, Margaret was from South Africa. She had moved to Asheville, North Carolina, probably 20 years ago. But most of her life was spent in South Africa. And in the early days of Ron Harbonke's ministry, she joined their ministry. And her role was that of an intercessor. And her, along with a lady named Suzette Hattin and other intercessors were engaged in the the prayer ministry with Bonke. And this is before Bonke's ministry got really large, but they would go into regions of Africa weeks oftentimes before Bonke and the crusade team would come in the, or the evangelistic team would come in and they would begin to pray and fast and intercede. And oftentimes Mags, or we called her Mags, Margaret would tell us that they would come under the burden of God, and they would weep and, and groan and wail sometimes for hours. And they knew that they were disturbing the atmosphere. They were breaking up the hard ground that had been there for so many years. Maybe some of it connected to ancestral worship or animism or all types of demonic witchcraft and, and demonic activity. And they knew that they were battling these demonic spirits by prayer. And they literally were feeling the heart of God. And the testimonies that came out of those meetings are, are supernatural. If you know anything about Bonky's ministry, you you realize how powerful that um, that Bonky was used primarily in Africa, but other parts of the world as well. And um, you know, God used those women and other intercessors to really bring about a disturbance, a divine disturbance that prepared the way for the message of the evangelist and for the salvation of souls and the deliverance of the people. And there are millions of people today that I believe are born again and serving the Lord in Africa and around the world because of women like Margaret Viss, because they disturb the atmosphere. They, they embrace the heart of God. Now, listen, friend, every one of you are called of God. You might not all be called to be a Ron Harbonke. You might not all be called to be a, a Pastor Joe Rarostic. Um, but every one of you are called. You're all called to proclaim the gospel. You're all called to, to make disciples. Every one of you are called to, to, to open your mouth and preach the word of God on a certain level. Every one of you are. But I'm going to tell you something. Your effectiveness comes not just by your obedience to do it, and that's clearly part of it. I understand that. But your powerful effectiveness comes through a life of prayer. Wilkerson said, David Wilkerson said that, we have no business praying to the to people that we have not wept over. And when we can weep and feel the heart of God through prayer that has words that can't even be uttered, through groaning, through, through tears, through weeping with the burden of God's heart, then, my friend, there's a level of, of ministry that takes place because of that that can't be found anywhere. Listen, you can't teach this in seminary. You can't. 
even teach this in Bible college, even though you can lay the foundation for it. But this is something that is learned through obedience to spend time with him and to ask him, Lord, give me your heart. You know, the prophet Jeremiah, he was the prophet to Judah before, during, and even some after the the experience with Babylonian captivity where they were taken to Babylon, um, the people of Judah, the Jews. And um, he, he said in one place, he said, the King James says it this way, which is very descriptive. He says, my bowels, my bowels, I writhe in pain. Another translation, he said, my agony, my agony, I writhe in pain. He he would say things like his 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 face or his tears were like a river. In other words, he would he would weep. He was known as the weeping or the 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 howling prophet because he could be heard under the burden of Yahweh's heart, under the burden of God's heart. He literally felt what God felt. I don't believe you could tell where his heart began and ended and where the heart of God began and ended. He became fused or amalgamated with the heart of God to such a point that that when he would pray, when he would weep, he was literally praying out the heartbeat of God through groanings, through howling, through, um, you know, intercession, through vehement cries unto the Lord. And again, I understand this is not the way that we pray all the time, but for the sake of the glory of Jesus, God awakened people, even in legacy ministry school, that will pay the price to know the Lord in this manner, that that will pay the price to walk in such a place of intimacy with the Lord, that they will pray the purposes of God, even in this place where sometimes we don't, don't even know what we are to pray for. And in that place, we just maybe pray in the spirit or we pray through groanings and tears and we allow the Lord to, to use us to accomplish his eternal purposes in the world. Friend, we need disturbance in prayer. We, we need agitators that will be clothed with the fire of God, that will be consumed with the heart of God, that will burn with eternal fire and they'll refuse to compromise and they won't be concerned with what other people do or don't do. They'll be so undertaken by the glory of God and so overwhelmed by his power that their lives will be a reflection of what it means to be a divine prophetic disturbance in their generation. They'll be like the prophet Samuel. Not one word that they speak will fall to the ground. They will bring a genuine, authentic word from God, a genuine, authentic move of God. Why? Because they pay the price to know the Lord in intimacy, in power, and in demonstration. I, I, I can say that, and I know I'm really just sharing my heart more than teaching today, but I felt like this was the place that, that the Lord wanted me to take you today, and this is what I want to impart to you. This is this is the foundation of everything I've ever done, everything that I'm doing, everything that I will ever do this side of heaven. For this, this is the foundation, this, this place of knowing the burden of God's heart. This is, this is everything to me. This is my DNA. Without this, there is no ministry for me. Lena Ravenhill said, when ministry becomes a profession and it ceases to be a passion, then we should get out of the ministry. I'm paraphrasing him, but basically what he was saying is, listen, Ministry is not just a professional vocation. Ministry is not just something we learn to do because we take homiletics. I mean, there can be benefit to those things. And I've taught homiletics, but but I've always told my students, it's not how you preach or teach, whether you are expository or topical. Those things are, are good to know about. And, you know, and I love to teach as well as exhort like I'm doing now. But listen, you can learn to do every bit of that and not know Jesus. But whenever everything that you do and everything that you are comes from a reservoir of intimacy with him, then, friend, there's not a devil in hell that can stop you. That's why Paul said, what shall separate me from the love of God? Shall principalities, powers, height, death. In other words, nothing could separate Paul from the love of Christ, even the great, what he called the great tribulation that he, he had in his life. He just called it brief momentary afflictions in one translation. In other words, 
being beat by the Jews, 39 lashes, five times being beat to death and left outside a city to die, being hungry, being naked, being cold, being imprisoned, being under house arrest, having people turn their backs on me. He said, everyone in Asia has pretty much turned their backs on me. I mean, being shipwrecked and spending uh, 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 spending hours and hours in the ocean. He said, all these things are light and momentary afflictions compared to the glory. What brings a man to that place? It's not just proper theology and doctrine, even though those things are vital to us, but he knew Jesus. He, he knew the heart of God. He, he ran his race with obedience, fueled by intimacy with the Lord, and nothing stopped him, friend. He, he finished his course. He, he found himself in those last days of his life on this side of eternity, as he stood with the elders from Ephesus at Miletus, and he told them, none of you will ever see me again. But he said, you know what? I don't have any blood on my hands. I've been faithful to discharge the call of God upon my life. There's been fruit in his life. He had fruit in his life. He was effective. He, he, he finished his course, he said. He, he ran his race. But I believe the fuel of everything in his life was the fact that he disturbed the atmosphere through his intimacy with Jesus. He was a man of deep prayer and intercession. He was a man that knew the heart of God. Listen, I, I sit here in my office today sharing with you in this chapel service, um, not because I deserve to be here. Paul said in Ephesians, there's, there's nothing that we could do to gain our salvation. It's not of works, lest any of us should boast. But I, I sit here today because someone was faithful in intercession. I I have a mother-in-law that she's with the Lord now. My father-in-law and mother-in-law are. Um, I was blessed to meet them before they passed away. I met them in 1985, October of 1985. I was born again, January of 85. And when I met them, I'd actually heard about my mother-in-law. She had a very strong word of knowledge gift on her and very powerful preacher and and teacher and and my father-in-law was an amazing pastoral teacher as well but when i first met her to be honest with you i was a little nervous to meet her because i'd heard about who she was in the lord and i wasn't raised in a christian home didn't know anything about the movement of the holy spirit or the gifts of the spirit until i was born again gloriously delivered from drugs and a bunch of other things but but anyway when i met my mother-in-law i'll never forget i flew from tallahassee florida to pittsburgh pennsylvania and her and my wife to be my fiance and her sister picked me up at the airport in Pittsburgh and drove me to their home in the northern part of West Virginia. When I got to their house, this woman walked down the porch and you have to understand my wife was a late child. When my wife was born, her mother was 48 and her father was 56. So her parents were in many ways like her grandparents. So they were very seasoned in the Lord. So when I walked up onto that little wooden porch that day, the little front porch, and she stepped out the door and she looked at me and tears began to fall down her face. And she pointed her finger at me and she said, I know you. She said, the Lord brought you to me in a dream three years ago and told me that you were coming to marry my daughter. And for three years, I've been praying for you. Now, she didn't realize that those three years that she prayed that, that I came from a family with a father who was a drug addict. And at the age of 51, he fell dead from drugs. He introduced me to substances, alcohol, narcotics, perversion, um, pornographic magazines at the age of eight years old that I have a brother who's been in prison in Florida for 28 years. I have another brother strung out on meth. Um, a lot of history. My great grandfather committed suicide. My grandfather committed suicide. My dad's only sibling, his sister committed suicide. She didn't realize that that's the type of family that I came from, but the Lord gave her a birth through a dream and she began to disturb the atmosphere. And for three years, almost 36 months, she said, almost three years ago, she said, you came to me in a dream. For almost three years, she prayed for me because she knew that God was sending me to marry her daughter. And I, I, I share with you today, friend, not because I'm qualified, not because I have education. I do have education. I've, I've went on to study and got a graduate degree and a business degree and a theology degree. And I've, I've been blessed to pastor four churches in the last 37 years, plant a church, done a lot of ministry work, overseen Bible schools. But my qualifications are nothing without intimacy with Jesus. And I know 
that I stand on the shoulders of my in-laws. I know I stand on the shoulders of my, my mother-in-law's prayer life because she paid a price to bring a disturbance in prayer. Listen, our world is free fallen into hell tonight or today. Our, our nation is degenerate. It's ungodly. It's perverted. It's twisted. And good church and good preaching is not going to change it, friend. Somebody somewhere has to be willing to say, Jesus, my life for the gospel. I don't care what people think about me. I don't care what people say about me. I don't care if I've got 30 years or 100 years to live. I want to burn for you, Lord. I want to be a firebrand. I want to be an agitator. I want to be a disturber. I want to mess up the plans of hell, the plans of the enemy in my city, in my family, in my school, in my community. And I refuse to live a subpar, weak, emaciated form of hybrid Christianity that brings about nothing but more religion and death. Lord, I want my life to count for the glory of God. And I want to submit my life to you so that I can become a man of prayer, a woman of prayer, so that I can know you in that secret place. Listen to the words of Oswald Chambers, and I'm going to pray in just a minute here. Oswald Chambers said, true intercession involves bringing the person or the circumstance that seems to be crashing in on you before God until you are changed by his attitude towards that person or circumstance. People describe intercession by saying, it is putting yourself in someone else's place. That is not true. Intercession is putting yourself in God's place. It is having his mind and his perspective. What is Chambers saying? Listen, friend, the type of prayer that he's talking about is not just praying with human pity and human sympathy, but he's talking about literally stepping in the place where the Lord is, the Romans 8 pattern, and praying with his heart. Let me give you one more quote. From Ian Bounds. Ian Bounds says, The wrestling quality of importunate prayer does not spring from physical vehemence or fleshly energy. It is not an impulse of energy, not a mere earnestness of soul. It is an inwrought force, a faculty implanted and aroused by the Holy Spirit. Virtually, it is the spirit of intercession. It is God within us. Friend, this, this is the place I believe that. That God's calling us to. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna close with some points. I know I've not given you a lot of points and those thing those type of things because I've just been sharing in my heart. But but I want to close with just some points and then I'm gonna pray and believe the Lord to to seal this word upon all of our hearts today and to change us and to bring us deeper into this place of of a prayer and intercession. This Romans eight place. So how does intercession really? effect how does disturbing prayer really make a difference number one it does it does create a divine disturbance or a discomfort among the people of god you show me an atmosphere or a place where someone really goes deep in prayer and i'll show you discomfort among the people that are there and they'll have a decision to make either they're going deeper in god or they're going to sit on the sidelines and watch the game from the sidelines number two Disturbing prayer reveals a dimension beyond normal church life and learn Christian behavior patterns. Eternity comes into view. Friend, prayer changes everything. It, it, it actually, I believe, oftentimes peels back the, the charade of programs and the things that we do because we fear that God will do nothing. Prayer brings about the reality of heaven, it, it creates the atmosphere of eternity in our midst. Number three, it illuminates the holiness of Jesus, and it polarizes sin in our midst. You, you cannot be a person intimate with the Lord and live in sin. You, listen, you can preach and be an adulterer. We see it all the time. You can prophesy and be a liar. <laughs> you can lead worship and be in secret sin. I mean, we see these things, unfortunately, front and center all the time. But can I tell you something? You cannot know Jesus intimately in prayer and live in continual sin. If, if you, if you do, then I don't believe your prayer is really real. You, you are changed through intimacy with Jesus. And if you're not being changed and further transformed into his image through this place of deep intercessory prayer, then friend, you're just kind of going through the motions and your prayer is just routine. It's just 
a discipline void of intimacy with God. So, so, so prayer brings the reality of the holiness of Jesus into view. It also um, causes anticipation and great expectancy. During the Brownsville Revival, and I was blessed to be there for most of that, there was a Southern Baptist church near Tallahassee, Florida. And the pastor got radically touched by the Lord during the midst of the revival. As a result, he didn't really know what to do. So he began to call a Monday night prayer meeting at his church and invited me to come multiple times. And I, I have never honestly in my life been in prayer meetings like that before or since. In that Baptist church, there was such an expectancy and such a hunger that was awakened in the heart of those people that as a result of that prayer meeting, I know for a fact there were dozens and dozens of people that were radically say we would we would embrace the burden of God's heart for maybe the worst of the worst drug dealer or sinner in the entire area. And it wasn't oftentimes days or weeks at the most. And those people would be radically arrested by conviction. Sometimes one man was out driving um, heavy equipment in the, in the Apachicola National Forest, and he thought an earthquake hit North Florida. But he he shut off his machine and his body continued to shake as conviction came on him. And we had prayed his name out for three weeks in a row and asking the Lord to intervene in his life. You see, prayer brings expectancy. It brings anticipation. It also removes the scales of religion from our eyes and creates a burning in our hearts because we behold that Jesus is in our midst. Next, it develops humility and meekness by what we see and prepares us to rightly carry the glory of God. Listen, the reason there's so much abuse in the area of the gifts of the Spirit and ministry callings and giftings is because men and women use them to promote, to build their own kingdoms. When you're a person of deep, disturbing prayer, um, there's an apostolic or a supernatural meekness and humility that you walk in. Why? Because you are constantly overwhelmed by the beauty, the glory, and the holiness of Jesus. So it 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 creates this place of humility. It also unclogs, it unclogs wells of revival in our hearts and it repairs the altar. And um, you know, there's there's so much more I could say about this subject I want for the sake of time. But Listen, as I come to a close, and I hope to be able to do this again with you in the future, my prayer right now is that there would be an impartation that would take place, that um, none of you would be the same again because you've been in the setting today, that the Holy Spirit now would go beyond my my voice and my experience and um, my exhortation, and that, that he would exhort you, that he would overwhelm you, that he would overtake you. And that you would understand as never before what it means to bear the heart of God in prayers of disturbance. That, that, that you would become a Holy Spirit-led agitator in this generation to see the glory of God revealed in this hour. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for truth today. We thank you, Lord, for the amazing opportunity that you give us to walk with you, to walk in prayer to know you in this, this place of intimacy. Forgive us for winging it, God. Forgive us for the, um, for the arrogance, for the audacity to think that we can just do ministry from habit and from routine. Forgive us, Lord, for leaning on the arm of flesh at times. Forgive us, Lord, for our sin of omission, our neglect of spending time with you. And Lord, I pray today, God, awaken our hearts to this deeper place. Let us experience what Paul talked about in Romans 8. Let us be a people that that pray with, with prayer, sometimes without words, because Holy Spirit, you come upon us and we 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 groan and we travail and we weep with your heart. Lord, we want to be those people. Make us a Jeremiah people, God. Awaken your heartbeat within us, Lord. Father, we pray for America right now. We pray for our nation. We pray for the nations of the world. Be glorified to your people. And Lord, may there be a revival of true praying in our own lives as well as in the church. We thank you, God, again, for the privilege to be at Legacy. But I just pray for a fresh anointing to be upon this, this ministry school, this school of discipleship, this school of higher learning that we would 
be taken higher into your glory and learn of you. I pray for wisdom and insight and revelation to come forth through every instructor, through every class, through every assignment, through every chapel. Holy Spirit, now you disturb us. Do not leave us alone, Lord. Bring us deeper into who you want us to be. We pray these things today in the glorious, matchless name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of this today. God bless all of you. And I do look forward to seeing you again in the future. May the grace and the glory and the fire of God be fresh in your life today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.